Welcome to Carlow County Council's Decade of Centenaries video series, brought to you by Carlow Libraries and Carlow County Museum, funded by the Department of Tourism, Culture, Arts, Gaeltacht, Sport and Media. Hello, you're very welcome to the Carlow County Council Decade of Centenaries video series, brought to you by Carlow Libraries and Carlow County Museum. During the series of videos, we'll present our viewers' discussions and insights into the stories, events, and historiography of the turbulent times of over a century ago, and hopefully provide our audience with a better understanding and appreciation of those momentous events. My name is John Kelly, I'm editor of the local historical journal Carloviana, and today I'm joined by Dr. Elaine Callanan in the wonderful and historic surrounds of Carlow College. Hello Elaine, how are you? Hello, how are you? Great to be here today. It and, is. Um, I suppose to start off, tell us a bit about your background, what attracted you to the study of history and what historical themes uh, you're particularly interested in? Uh, well, I've always been very interested in history ever since I was a schoolgirl, which is neither today nor yesterday. Um, and it's not something I pursued straight after college. I actually went down the field of marketing and advertising and public relations. But when I found an opportunity to return to college again, I decided history was what I wanted to pursue. And um, I was particularly interested in Irish history and a more modern Irish history, really from the 1600s onwards. I know the 1600s seems like a long time ago, but uh, from that period onwards. But I got particularly interested in even the more modern uh, and that period of the decade of revolution in Ireland. So uh, that's the area I decided I wanted to focus on. But I'm interested, yes, in politics, but also in society, uh, how ordinary people think and felt during this time. So that's also why politics interested me. So I did a humanities degree here in Carlow College, and then I went on and did a master's and a PhD in Trinity College Dublin, and continuously pursued history uh, up to right this minute. I lecture yeah. in history here now. Thanks very much. And of course, you've produced this really excellent book, um, Electioneering of Propaganda in Ireland, 1917 to 1921, which sort of forms the basis of our, our chat today. Um, so thinking about your book, why are elections so important to study? And what information can you give us about national life and, and local life in the period? Well, I think they're very important to study from two different angles. Um, I mean, we're all very familiar with the military happenings during the decade of revolution. But sometimes in order to get to what the ordinary person thought, felt, acted, did, uh, politics is a great arena for doing that. Uh, because we can look at it from the perspective of the politicians themselves and the, the political parties and how they were selling their ideas and what their ideas were. But then when we come to some degree to see how uh, you know, people voted and how they reacted to that type of propaganda, we get an understanding of how ordinary people, men and women during this time, were reacting to what was going on around them. And you know, one of the main arguments I would make is that more people were involved in election activities be they you know, propagandists, political parties, or ordinary people than were involved in the military happenings of this time. Because ordinary people have to cast a vote. So they have to become active at that stage. Yeah, and I think we'll talk about that later on in, in yeah. terms of what, what the, the profile of the people who voted were and, and the changes coming up, to, coming up to the 1918 election that, mm -hmm. that are really, really significant. But to start off, I suppose, what were the main political parties at play? Um, well, you had four main political parties um, during this period. Um, prior to 1918, which was the big election during this time, and that was the kind of election of momentous change, uh, the main political party was the Irish Parliamentary Party, um, and you, you had a couple of other ad hoc ones. But by 1918, you had new um, people on the scene, new political parties on the scene. You had Sinn Féin, which had formed really... Um, well, it had formed in 1905 with Arthur Griffith as a small monarchical party, but it didn't really come to you know, prominence until after 1916, and that was largely because they were blamed for the 1916 rising, and that's a blame they appropriated and ran with uh, subsequently. So they became very active uh, in the period 1917 and 1918. But you also had the Labour Party um, that were active during this time as well, uh, very much so in trade union movements. 
Um, and the other political uh, entity uh, that existed on the island of Ireland and here in Carlow as well was uh, Unionists, um, which approached things from a completely different uh, perspective mm. than Nationalists. So they would have been the four main contenders, but you would have had independence as well uh, during this time. And speaking, you were speaking about Sinn Féin there and how they're a monarchical party. And a little bit of a counterfactual question, I suppose, is um, if the rising, if, the, if the, the results of the rising had been dealt with in a more sympathetic manner by the British authorities, if they didn't execute the, the, um, the leaders, um, would we have seen the emergence of Sinn Féin? Is that the pivotal thing that drove Sinn Féin forward? Uh, that's a loaded question, but a very good one. Um, and it's fun to do a little bit of counterfactual history sometimes. Um, it's a very hard question to answer uh, because certainly everything, like a lot of what Sinn Féin did for the 1916 Rising in terms of appointing candidates, uh, the type of propaganda that they used, relied on the events of the 1916 Rising. So um, it certainly was a, you know, a big backdrop uh, to them in terms of that. It also, that blame that they received, uh, which was spread across all of the Irish newspapers and all of the British newspapers, gave them momentum. Um, and it also gave them massive publicity. So it, it, it sparked their turn to politics. Mm. And of course, the, the main leader at the time was Eamon de Valera. Um, Arthur Griffith had kind of taken a back seat at this stage and de Valera had come to prominence. And, you know, he was really, I suppose, trying to move away from the militant rebel activities of 1916 and in a way sort of turn rebel to politician. Um, and here was the prime moment to do it. And it began really with the, the series of by-elections that happened in 1917 and took off completely for 1918. Mm. And that by-elections reference sort of gives a nice segue into the next part and about, say, Carlo and... Like who were the, who were the dominant politi politicians in Carlow at that stage? Who were the big personalities? Well, you had a couple of big personalities um, in Carlow politics during this time, um, and uh, you know one of the main prominent local politicians was Michael Governey, and sometimes he's not inclined to feature in the story because he very much stayed at the local level, but uh, as most Carlow people know, he was a very big businessman in the town. He's from Ballyline in the county Leash, at least his family were. And he moved to Carlow at quite a young age um, and became involved in Corcoran's mineral water factory. Um, married Thomas Corcoran's daughter and uh, eventually took over that mm -hmm. particular industry. Um, but throughout his life, generally speaking, he was very involved in the county council and the urban district council and brought, uh, you know, you know, was very involved in, for example, the um, you know, tendering for the town hall, for bringing electric street lighting to Carlow Town, and, an, and the waterworks and collection was another big project of his. So, you know, he, he was a prominent politician in this town and was constantly returned, served a lot of time as chairman of the uh, mm -hmm. county council too. And you see him constantly mentioned throughout this period in the local newspaper, the Nationalist and Leinster Times, but he was an ardent home ruler, um, really up until post-1918. And then we see him switch a little bit at that stage. Yeah, that was a very controversial switch. To um, come from a, a point where he would have been seen as opposing the rising in the aftermath of it and then becoming um, a, a sort of a Sinn Féin candidate. Do, do you think he was a populist or was he a more shrewd politician than that? I think he was more shrewd, uh, to be fair to him. Um, he was also a very, very good businessman. I mean, bear in mind, he also opened the boot factory here in the town. So he knew the people um, and he knew what they would react to. Uh, so, you know, he was an ardent home ruler. And even in 1918, he was still a home ruler. Uh, he would have, you know, been on speaking platforms for... Um, was it Robert Donovan or Richard Donovan, I can't remember the first name, um, who was the Irish Parliamentary mm -hmm. Party candidate. But the tide did turn slightly um, in Carlow in terms of where politics was going. And the Irish Parliamentary Party were massively defeated in 1918. So there was little point in him remaining um, you know, on that side. So he did switch over to become uh, involved on, on the Sinn Féin side. But in terms of the 1916 rising, uh, Carlow County Council would have issued a resolution condemning the rising in the immediate aftermath of it. 
But that was not unique to Carlow. Um, most county councils across the country did the very same thing. Uh, in the immediate aftermath of the rising, a lot of people were very angry with the rebels uh, because of the destruction of the capital city, because of the way they'd conducted themselves in the middle of a great war. Uh, you know, when thousands of Irishmen were out uh, fighting um, in, in the, in the theatres of battle uh, ac across Europe and elsewhere. So there was a lot of controversy over the arising in the immediate aftermath. But then when you move on to the executions um, and uh, the, the mass arrests subsequent to the risings, you do see the mood changing. Um, and you see the mood even of the county council changing at that stage. And then they issue a kind of an addendum maybe to that resolution or a further resolution which calls for clemency uh, for those mm. that were involved in the rising. And, um, you know, you can see that they are also representing the mood of the people. Um, and that mood would have been, you know, while all that was happening in Carlow, it reflects what was happening in the rest of the country as well. I, I think that's a, a really, really strong point mm. that it was, it wasn't just one resolution, that it, it was, there was an evolution yeah, in your a, thinking as well. Yeah. And what other dominant personalities were there in politics, say on the unionist side or on the Republican side? Um, well, certainly on the uh, the Republican side, uh, you would have had uh, the, the person that was appointed in 1918 uh, to represent Sinn Féin was a man called James Lennon. A kind of interesting character. Um, mm. And I'm not sure that Carlo people themselves would have actually um, gone for him, but he was uh, elected unopposed because uh, Donovan pulls out of the uh, election. So it gives him a walkover, basically, mm. in the county. But he was a Republican, um, and just prior to the uh, 1918 election, he had been arrested, and he was interned in loose prison, um, and really spent the, the, the entire election period in jail at the time. So a lot of his canvassing and uh, propaganda efforts were conducted by other people that supported Sinn Féin. There was, uh, you know, quite some interesting debates that happened in Carlow mm -hmm. uh, in the, you know, the initial phase of the election when there were the two candidates that were vying for the seat. But um, really, in, in the end, Lenin gets the walkover. But, you know, when you look to the later elections, like the 1922 election, for example, uh, which I know was the pact election and they mm -hmm. were discussing other things like treaties and things, James Lennon did really badly. In mm -hmm. fact, he came last um, and got something like, I can't remember the exact number, but about 1,100 votes. Mm -hmm. So he probably then wasn't a candidate that was favoured by people of Carlow uh, at the time. In fact, actually in 1922, they elected a Labour candidate, mm -hmm. um, a Flower Miller from Carlow for the Labour Party. So that tells us a little bit where Carlow leanings might have been in you know, if you think of the industry that was here at the yeah. time, and if you think of the industry that's to come, like the sugar factory in 1926, that's where the mood of the people was, you and know. You, then your personalities later on, like Pauline McGowan, uh, Paddy Bergen, who yeah. were very involved in, 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 that, in, that, in, in that, that sphere. That sphere, yeah, and yeah. From my own research, I suppose, the unionists seem to have been very, very quiet. They, they, they didn't really engage, as far as I could see, in, in, in very much politics in this period? Not in the big elections. Uh, I mean, even if you go back to the 1910 elections, uh, you know, which kind of get written out uh, in terms of <coughs> the, this particular period, even though it's just before the decade of revolution, where the Irish Parliamentary Party candidate, Michael Malloy, is uh, elected unopposed here in Carlow. Uh, you know, it signifies that there's not much competition um, from other uh, parties or other interests. But when you go local, when you go into the local elections, you see a little bit of a different story. And I think the local elections, um, you know, are a little bit more representative of what ordinary people are thinking. And in the 1920 local elections, we see three unionist candidates uh, elected. Mm. And we see a smattering of different, um, you know, parties represented after 1920 in the urban district council elections. So that tells us that there was a lot of mixed opinion um, in Carlow during this period over what was going on because 1920 is not that far removed from 1918. Mm -hmm. So what if there had been greater choice in terms of candidates in 1918? 
just, I mean, here I am engaging in the counterfactual <laughs> history now, but, uh, you know, the, 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 the end result might have been slightly different mm. in that regard. And of course, they continued to cooperate on the Board of Guardians, different bodies like that as well. They did, and, yeah. And, and, and I mean, even Michael more. Malloy was very heavily involved in the Board of Guardians during his time mm. um, in, in Carlo. And again, you know, w- it would have been involved in, in industry in the town too. So, uh, I mean, Carlo politicians have actually been good businessmen as well as politicians. And I think that for a period of time here in this town was of great benefit to the town. Um, and it's something that perhaps ought to be thought about in the future, in the present, if you like, um, because they did bring added value with that business acumen mm-hmm. uh, to, you know, going alongside politics. I suppose the other thing we should talk about really is the impact of women in, in the local election. I just I saw an online comment during this week on this year's Carlo Viana that we have a picture of the famous picture of the the, the three women escapees um, in Ducats Grove in, in the in the um, the IRA camp. Um, and somebody made a comment that it was the first appearance of, of a woman on the front page of Carlo Viana. I didn't go back and check it. But um, what role did, did, did uh, in politics did, um, did, Car- did women in Carlo play in the parliamentary elections? Uh, well, th- no women candidates ran in Carlo. Um, but bear in mind that there was a reasonably strong um, coming to man movement uh, in Carlo. Now, a lot of that is post-1918 and, you know, as you run through the War of Independence. There was practically a coming to man association in every parish um, mm-hmm. in Carlo Town. Now, the numbers weren't huge. Um, you know, when you tally them all up, there was only about 135, but there were fairly active women uh, that were involved in it. When it came to 1918, uh, it's important to remember as well that women had to be over 30 years of age to be able to vote or run as candidates. Mm -hmm. Um, And they had to have, uh, you know, some property qualifications to go with that. So that limited the ability of women to run in 1918. It didn't limit their ability to become politically involved, though. Um, And a lot of women, uh, particularly on the Sinn Féin and Labour side, would have been very involved uh, nationally. Um, in, and I suppose I should include unionists there as well, um, on getting out, doing the canvas, um, you know, encouraging people to vote, putting mm-hmm. up the posters, going door to door, uh, and all of those kind of things. And you see a lot of commentary on that um, in, in newspapers at the time. But you also see commentary on the numbers of women that turned out to vote. And um, so it does tell us that, it, you know, even in Carlo, uh, you know, women took that new opportunity to vote in general elections very, very seriously and did actually move themselves to, to polling stations to vote. And it wasn't like today where your polling station is only a hop and a skip. You know, you, you had to travel to polling stations and you, you had to get there by your own means, largely speaking. So women also became involved in making sure that people had the ability to get to the polling station. So they would, you know, pass on information to the main political parties to say that so-and-so needs a lift in order to cast their vote and cars would be sent out. So they played a very, very strong role Mm -hmm. um, in in campaigning and in voting. Uh, And certainly on the military side as well. You, you can they see, did. You can now, on the military side, they did. And of course, they're famously known for their work in Ducats Grove mm-hmm. uh, that you just mentioned there. Ducats Grove became a sort of field hospital mm-hmm. uh, during the War of Independence. So, um, you know, they, they, a lot of women would have not only, get, but in this area particularly, I suppose, they were primarily involved in things like first aid, uh, you know, giving, attending to soldier or soldiers, I suppose we could call them, that were involved in uh, military campaigns. They would have also done some of the domestic work um, around all of that as well. But you know, nationally speaking, um, women were also involved in things like uh, gun running, um, you know, taking ammunition mm-hmm. from place to place. Um, they would have been involved in the intelligence work, uh, letting the IRA know what was going on, uh, who was traveling from where, um, and a lot of that information even passed through women that worked in post offices and places like that. So um, they were militarily active as well. Uh, It probably in slightly different ways than the men, largely speaking, but certainly in the more subtle areas, but in the very important areas uh, to, to have a successful military campaign. But not to overestimate it either, uh, because it's important to remember, particularly in a town like Carlow, 
that you know, was a garrison town uh, that did send quite a substantial amount of young men out to the Great War. Uh, that, you know, this was a small number of women and there were home rule women here too and there were unionist women as well. And, you know, women, just like the men in Ireland, you know, had different political leanings and different beliefs as well. And sometimes I think we're inclined to focus an awful lot on the kind of Republican women and forget about the other mm. women um, that had different views. It sounds like the basis for a very good book. It does, uh, doesn't it? Basis. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I always remember um, reading about the Miss Laffins. I think they had a cafe on Tullow Street and they seemed to be regularly being raided for the propaganda material they had. They would have been actually. Now yeah, they went yeah. on to uh, get, Bridget Laffin went on to be elected in the 1920 mm. elections. Right. Uh, she was one, there was 42 uh, women elected uh, locally in 1920. Three in one ward here in Carlow. I can't remember the ward now, but it was a nine seat ward and three women in that ward were elected and she was one of them. Which would have been probably a high proportion for that time, would it? Yeah, oh God, yeah, it would have yeah. been, yeah, yeah, very much so. I yeah. think so, yeah. <laughs> And I suppose, think about the general population and their engagement with politics. When you look at, say, the 1913, the, the film we have of John Dillon's um, Home Rule um, rally in Carlo, and the crowds are there and they're waving and, and they're, they're, they're clapping, but um, it strikes me, number one, is that there was such a huge crowd, you probably wouldn't have heard him at the back. I know Daniel O'Connell, I think, used to have repeaters where people would repeat stuff. I don't know if we had that. But also, do you think that the amount of people on that day, that there, that there was a general feeling of engagement, or for a lot of people, it was just a day out. I think both. Um, I, certainly, there would have been, a, you know, the, the local politicians, the likes of Michael Governor, and that would have rallied the people to turn up uh, for for John Dillon arriving in town. But bear in mind, he was a noted politician as well. Uh, I mean, this is akin to a film star arriving in town. Uh, so. Um, you know, you went out even if you weren't politically active uh, because it was a form of entertainment. I mean, if you look at that film, which is a great film, great piece of film, uh, you see that there's marching bands, uh, you know, going ahead of the crowd. It, it's spectacular um, in, in terms of what is put on. And then Dylan comes into town uh, on the train and the crowds gather and he stands up and he addresses people. and. I mean, for a start, that film gives us a huge amount of information because we can look back on a period of life in Carlo and see how people were dressed and how they reacted uh, to all of this going on. But speech making uh, was really one of the main forms of propaganda for political leaders at this time. I mean, you're in an era where there's no film, film is still silent, no radio, uh, that's yet to come. So you, you had to talk to people, you had to get out and meet people. So how did somebody at the back hear what mm -hmm. was going on? Well, they actually didn't, um, but that was neither here nor there. It was the total ambience of it. Um, and when you get into a contested uh, election, like say 1918, if you were to go along to Robert Donovan's uh, speeches in Shamrock Square or wherever it happened to be, uh, you know, you would have seen all the symbols of the Irish party, like the, the green flag with the, the gold harp mm -hmm. on it. And then you might go over to, you know, some of James Lennon's, um, you know, he didn't speak, but those who were speaking on his behalf, and you would have seen the tricolour. Um, so all of that was still convincing people. And of course, what had to play a huge role then was your local paper, mm -hmm. because the local newspaper printed uh, word for word Before, everything yeah. that was said at those speeches. So that was really important to political parties as well, but also to local people. And when you look at the level of reading um, of Irish people in this time, even here in Carlow Town, um, you know, if you work it off the 1911 census, you can see that there was a very good, there, there was a good standard of reading. Um, like everybody could read and write, or practically everybody could read and write. Now, they mightn't have been able to read Ulysses, but they could certainly read the local mm -hmm. newspaper. So um, that reprinting of the speeches became very important. But people went to those speeches because it was a form of entertainment. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, not only did you go to see, you know, visibly see the, the politician and maybe get the general gist of what was being said, but you went for the spectacular, the pipe bands, uh, all the demonstrations that went with it, the pomp, the ceremony, the pageantry. Um, and you also went because there wasn't a whole pile else to do. 
Um, so if the whole town was going out to something, you weren't going to sit at home, mm -hmm. you know. So I would say some of those uh, election meetings would have been spectacular, you know. I'd, I said it would, yeah. yeah. And, and of course the speeches, but you look at it, it's not just that, that meeting, but most speeches were actually printed for, verbatim and for a researcher to go back through them. It, it, they're so important oh, they to, are. to be able to, mm. to, to, to understand the thinking of, of, of the speaker. Well, the beauty of even some of the, the correspondence uh, that, that reprinted those speeches at the time is that they comment on the huge crowd that was there to listen to so-and-so. Uh, they also interject words like applause, cheering, or, you know, what crowd reaction, mm -hmm. basically. And, of course, that's really important to, you know, me, a researcher at the time, when I'm trying to establish how ordinary people were reacting to you know, political speeches or political propaganda. Because if they're applauding and they're not booing, um, well, then they're supporting. So um, that they put even down that detail into this kind of editorial is, is really helpful. They're great. They're really great to mm. read. Yeah, they are, yeah. Just going on, to, I suppose, to the 1918 election, get back to it a, a bit. Um, was it a single-issue election? Or, or, or were there... there other, did the parties have other policies? Uh, both, if you want the, 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 the honest answer. Um, the single issue for each political party, so I'll just go with the four, even though there were a few mm -hmm. minor independents, but uh, for, for each political movement, shall we say, they had their own issue. issue. For unionists, it was the maintenance of the union between um, Ireland and Britain. For Irish Parliamentary Party, it was Home Rule. Now, Home Rule was on the statute book, uh, but it had been suspended for the duration of the war. The war ended in 1918, and the election happened four or five weeks later. So, um, Home Rule was now a, a real possibility, but it had been there a long time. I mean, you know, you were going back to Parnell's time. So, the Irish Parliamentary Party, in fairness, had to struggle to get that message out there to people. Uh, or to keep it alive uh, in the minds of people. For Sinn Féin, uh, their two main um, you know, agenda items were abstention from Westminster. In other words, if you elected the, the Sinn Féin candidate, they wouldn't go as an MP to Westminster. Now, they never said during the 1918 election what they would do. I mean, Dáil Éireann hadn't even been mentioned at this stage. And the other was that instead of appealing to the, the imperial parliament like the Irish Parliamentary Party were doing, they were going to appeal to the Paris Peace Conference, mm -hmm. which was the end of war peace conference. And then Labour uh, were coming at it, uh, not so much even from, um, yes, they were coming at it from an independence point of view, really using James Connolly as their symbol uh, for a, a socialist republic, if you like, going into the future. So, yes, those high ideals were very important and formed the, the main impotence of, impetus of political campaigning uh, in, the, in the early weeks um, of the election campaigning. But then it begins to dawn on these political parties that, you know, ordinary people are not just interested in home rule union, socialist republic, whatever it happens to be. They want to know who's going to pay the old age pension, uh, who's going to fund education, what about health? What about housing? Housing is a huge mm -hmm. issue back then. It's like, uh, you know, it's, it's like something that's never gone off the agenda here in Ireland. Um, I mean, if you go back to 100 years ago, you actually see the same issues then as you're seeing now, um, even in places like Carlow. So, um, you know, the bread and butter issues become paramount amongst the political party. So they, 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 you see a slight swing mm -hmm. um, into, you know, Home rulers saying that, well, if we have our own home rule, we'll be able to manage paying the pensions. Unionists arguing that, well, you won't. Uh, you don't bring in enough taxation. We need the, the British Exchequer to, you know, pay pensions and pay for law and order and all that kind of thing. Um, and you see Sinn Féin making the argument that, well, if we have our own independent parliament, we will collect our own taxes. We will not have to pay such huge money over to the British Exchequer and we'll be able to manage things perfectly. So... They were using the high ideals, if you like, to answer the bread and butter mm. issues or the everyday issues. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Uh, um, there you <coughs> go. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, also, just getting back to it on the national level, I know we spoke about women on a local level, but um, in your book you state that women played a part in the outcome of the election 
Uh, and was this the first time that women really exerted um, influence on the election? And how did they actually affect the outcome? Um, well, women were be had began to um, exert influence really since the Local Government Act of 1898 because this allowed women to become involved at the local level in things like the Board of Guardians or uh, the, the Urban and Rural District Councils. Um, but in 1918, things changed dramatically. Um, you have the representation of the People Act, and that gives voting rights to women over 30 years of age and men over 21 years of age and servicemen over 19 years of age. So it increases the electorate substantially. I mean, nationally speaking, it went from something like 700,000 to uh, nearly 2 million people who could vote. When we look at Carlo, it was roughly 6,000 voters before 1918, and that jumped to 16,000 here in Carlo um, with the representation mm -hmm. of the People Act. So uh, that means that women, um, could, aside from being able to run as candidates, could now literally go out and vote. And because they turned out in good numbers, they would certainly be one of the aspects that uh, you know swung things in favour of Sinn Féin. And where that, that you know Sinn Féin would have made a difference um, in this era to women voters was because they were advocating for suffragism, um, and the Irish Parliamentary Party had sort of shot themselves in the foot in regard to that. Um, I mean, going back to you mentioning John Dillon, um, I mean, he argued at one point in time that giving women the vote would be the ruination of Western civilization. Um, but all across uh, Britain and Ireland, that representation of the People Act uh, mm. made a big difference in the 1918 election because this was an election that was run across both countries. Uh, in Ireland, uh, I would argue, uh, you know, certainly women took up that um, and went out and voted. And because they didn't want to vote for the Irish Parliamentary Party candidate, they voted for mm -hmm. the Sinn Féin candidate. Now, women in Carlow didn't get that opportunity because it was one of the 25 constituencies that uh, candidate became mm -hmm. elected unopposed. But that tells us something too, um, and it's very important uh, information, and it doesn't rule Carlow out as being an important county in this election, because then you have to ask the question, why? Uh, mm -hmm. Why was there an uncontested constituent, uh, you know, contest here? Um, and the answer to that lies in, uh, you know, the thinking of the people. The main argument that is put forward um, at the time, and I think it was reported on in The Nationalist, um, was that the entire county had swung towards uh, the Republican side, and therefore there was no point in running an Irish Parliamentary Party candidate in this election. Um, Michael Malloy had retired, uh, so he was no longer uh, going to run, and you had uh, Robert Donovan. I think it was a little bit more than that, and I think we have to look to 1922 and to even the 1920 local elections, as I said, to gauge the mood of, Ir of Carlo people. I just think they weren't either Sinn Féin or Irish Parliamentary Party, broadly speaking. Now, there would have been supporters for both. Um, I actually think they were more Labour, um, but that option didn't exist. Mm -hmm. So um, the uncontested constituency went over to Sinn Féin. And mentions of Labour, I suppose, uh, in your book, you, you speak about Labour and you, you put forward a, a different reason for abstention of Labour from the election, from the commonly sort of, the, the, the common trope, which is that uh, the, the nobly stood, stood aside to, to allow the, the question to be answered. Um, would you like, like to just talk about why, Labour, why you believe Labour didn't yeah, well, take part in the election? Thomas Johnson, who became the leader of the Labour Party at the time, did actually put forward that statement when they withdrew from the 1918 election. Uh, they actually stated that, uh, you know, we were withdrawing from this election because we thought it was going to be a war election and not a peace election. And it was a peace election because the war had ended. And they wanted to give people um, the opportunity to choose between the two main nationalist parties, which were Sinn Féin and the Irish Parliamentary Party. But actually, when you look a little bit deeper at Labour, um, I mean, Labour were doing some very, very good work um, mm. around the country at the time. They were heavily involved in trade union movements. Um, they were involved in a lot of strike action um, around the country as well to get better conditions, um, working conditions and pay conditions for people. 
So they were tapping into people all the time to subscribe for strike funds uh, and all of that. So it was going to be very difficult to tap into that same group again to seek election funds. So I think that Labour would have liked to have run candidates in 1918. I think they were ready in terms of ability to run candidates um, in 1918, but they were just trying to divide themselves in too many different ways mm -hmm. and something had to go. Uh, and that was the one that actually went for them because the other things were too important. And you have to bear in mind as well that the question of partition is rocking down the line to what's going to happen over Ulster. So, um, you know, the trade unions in Ireland were very closely associated with the trade unions in Ulster and mm -hmm. also the trade unions in Britain. Uh, so that was going to be a big step uh, for Labour as well going into the future um, and running a general election candidates through all of that and finding election candidates through mm -hmm. all of that was going to be tough. That, that's really interesting. Mm. Um, and when we look at, I suppose, politics and we think about the likes of Sinn Féin and particularly who would have been, I suppose, a, for certain extent, a little bit of revolutionary party at that stage. Um, the, 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 the old phrase, vote early and vote often, um, was, was voter fraud a, a factor in the election in 1918? It was. Um, you had, and there's some very, very, you know, funny stories uh, that come out of it, uh, where you see people turning up to cast their votes uh, and finding that they've no vote at all because somebody else has taken their vote. Uh, so th there was a lot of personation um, mm. and people would go in and vote on behalf of somebody else. The only thing that I would say is that each political, every political party did it. Uh, they mm. all had their personators. And I mean, elections then were very different than now. Um, you know, you, you, the campaigning went right up to the moment you, you, you were literally at the ballot paper. Mm -hmm. So people were thrusting leaflets at you as you were walking in to cast your vote. They were still trying to persuade you to vote in their favour. All of those things were going on. There was bunting, there was every... Again, you're back to pageantry. Uh, election day was a big thing. So, uh, and of course, this election was novel because this was the first time that the election across... Uh, Ireland and Britain had been held on the one day. Uh, normally elections were held over months. Mm -hmm. So everybody was going to the poll on the same day. So that even created more kind of, uh, you know, campaigning on election day. So, uh, you know, that meant that, uh, you know, vote early and vote often. Um, well, people did vote early, actually, mm -hmm. funnily enough, um, and they did vote often. But as I said, when they arrived at the polling booth, uh, sometimes their vote wasn't there. Um, and, and that caused, But then there was also problems with the Register of Electors mm. for 1918. And the other problem that, you know, when you're looking at it nationally speaking, that was a problem was um, absent voters or abstaining voters. Mm. In some constituencies, not too far away from Carlow down the road in Waterford, there was huge violence, um, it, you know, around election time and around election campaigning. So people were afraid to turn out. Uh, in some constituencies, uh, there was, you know, you had to choose between the Irish Parliamentary Party candidate or Sinn Féin, and for some people that just wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. They didn't want either, uh, so they didn't turn out to vote. And the other thing is, the Great War had just ended. And, uh, you know, if you look at the numbers, like 210,000 Irishmen went out to fight in that war. So by, the, you know, election time, many of them hadn't returned. 30,000 of them had died. Mm -hmm. So uh, for the Irish Parliamentary Party and Unionists in Ireland, uh, th they were missing a lot of their voters mm. and they were missing a lot of their campaigners. I think you give a figure of 400,000 of the, of the electorate didn't, didn't vote. Was, was uh, I can't remember? actually remember the, yeah. the, the entire figure, but certainly, uh, you know, that there's high numbers in many constituencies that didn't vote. Quite, quite substantial. Yeah. I think, and yeah. then, you know, we're in COVID times now, though the big uh, Spanish flu was all across the mm -hmm. land during that time. And... You know, that affected about 20,000 people. Um, so if you were ill with the Spanish flu, you weren't turning out to vote either. So there was a number of reasons why people didn't turn out to vote. Uh, so, you know, you have to kind of be careful in looking at the 1918 election and even in the claim that it was a landslide victory uh, for Sinn Féin because 25 constituencies were uncontested and we don't actually really know how people might have voted. Mm -hmm. um, People hadn't returned from the Great War. There was a, influenza was going around the country. Uh, there was a lot of violence um, connected to the election campaigns. But you know, a, a, an aftermath even of 1916, volunteer organisations were being set up. I mean, we see quite a few of them being set up here in Carlow in 1917. 
um, and, and coming to man organizations as well. So there was a lot going on um, mm. that kind of influenced how people would have behaved during this time. And I suppose we can move on maybe a little bit in time on this as well. You, you've already spoke about the, 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 the subsequent elections. Was there much enmity in, in, the, in the political discourse, after, say after the civil war, in the, the first few years of, of the new state? Uh, you, yes and no. Um, certainly when you look at it uh, from a national scale, uh, you see, um, you know, the, of course, the, the, the parties change um, as you move post-civil war. Uh, you have a, a plethora of different, uh, you know, coalition type parties uh, in 1922 for the pact election. But when you move on to the, onto the Irish Free State um, and the, the likes of the 1923 election, uh, you know, th this is when you have the establishment of Common Gael, um, and um, you still have Sinn Féin there, mm -hmm. but, you know, Common Gael are really com coming on in leaps and strides, and they will win that election. Uh, and But the propaganda nationally is uh, still picking at each other, you know, like, you know, who voted for the treaty mm -hmm. and um, who supported the treaty, don't support the treaty. Uh, all of those kind of issues are still there. So you can see the hang up um, on both sides from whether you were pro-treaty or anti-treaty. Mm. Um, and of course, that was the cause of the Civil War. Um, you know, the, the whole, you know, idea of what side you were on mm. in terms of the, the Anglo-Irish Treaty of 1921. And it does cause um, factions within families. But when you compare the Irish Civil War to some of the other civil wars that happen um, you know, in, in other countries, what's interesting about the Irish Civil War is that um, it doesn't have a high death toll. I know that's a, a strange mm -hmm. thing to say, that the death toll is quite low. So it means that, largely speaking, it was very much an ideological war. Um, and uh, Now, that doesn't mean there was no military activities. In mm -hmm. fact, actually, Carlo is... Uh, the kind of Carlo Kilkenny area is very interesting during the Civil War uh, in terms of stopping pro-treaty troops uh, moving through the mm -hmm. area uh, and forcing them to go towards the sea to get around to the mm -hmm. south of Ireland. Uh, and then they, they destroy internal uh, infrastructure like bridges and railway lines and things like that. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, it, it has been played out in places like Carlo. But in the aftermath, um, there's a kind of a silence as well amongst people. Uh, they don't want to talk about it. They want to move on mm -hmm. from the Civil War. Um, but what we see coming out of it, of course, is what we hear on the radio, uh, you know, every time an election comes along, which is Civil War politics. Mm -hmm. uh, but we see this more when uh, de Valera establishes Fianna Fáil, um, mm -hmm. like in the later elections, uh, the likes of the 1927 elections or the early 1930s. And um, you see Fianna Fáil and uh, Common Gael really pitting themselves against mm -hmm. each other and harking back to their stance uh, during the Civil War. But does that influence ordinary people? Yes, it does. Um, but they're also bringing in all of the new things that are happening at the time. And in places like Carlow, they're talking about the sugar factory mm -hmm. uh, because that's what's happening in 1926 here. So uh, they're more important to people. Uh, jobs, housing, and all of those kind of issues play a strong part too. So at a, at a local level, it was business as usual? So at a local at a level, level and... at a local level, it usually <clears throat> is business as usual. Uh, and people do move on fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. But what I suppose where you see how people lay in the civil war in terms of their affinity to pro or anti treaty mm -hmm. is in the parties, the political parties they subsequently support. Because if you support Common Gael, you're pro treaty. If mm -hmm. you support Fianna Fáil, you are anti treaty. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which still went, goes on. It still does, <laughs> it but I'm not sure that people today, uh, particularly young people, no, cast their votes with, with anything to do with that. Um, and seem, seem, given the overall, the overwhelming support, well, uh, you say I suppose it's not overwhelming, it hasn't been proved, but that, that it, it was, um, there seemed to be a lot of support for Sinn Féin in Carlow in 1918. Um, we might have expected a, a, a more active, armed struggle in Carlow during that period. And while there was a number of incidents, it, it wouldn't have been at a very high level, I think. 
Yeah, I think actually it needs a little bit more exploration. Um, now I've delved into it a little bit, but I'd like to delve into it a little bit mm. more. Uh, because Carlow is an interesting county, particularly because it's literally uh, in the middle uh, of the country and it's also in the southeast. And when we look at the Civil War, or when other historians have written about the Civil War, they've largely focused on the bigger areas, mm -hmm. like the Dublins, uh, the Corks, the Kerrys, the Waterfords, uh, and I'm just looking at the south southeast here. There's more to it than all of that. Um, and I wouldn't say that Carlo was inactive. I'd say they were active in different ways. And, um, and again, I think we have to look at the, the population that lived in Carlo and who they were. Uh, I mean, Carlo was a bustling town um, and it was a prosperous town uh, during this time. So, uh, you know, the, the, the or people did not necessarily want to get involved in these big military campaigns. Mm because they had work. Um, I mean, what they were striving for more was housing rather than work. So, um, but at the same time, those that were involved in it uh, were active, but they were active, as I said, in a different way. Mm -hmm. They may not have been going around with tanks and guns, uh, but they were creating difficulties for troop movements mm -hmm. um, in and around the area, and they were very involved in intelligence. So, uh, you know, and that I would say throughout the War of Independence and the Civil War um, mm. in, in Carlow. And the barrack burnings, there was a lot of barrack burnings in Carlow. There would have been. Yeah, um, and of yeah. course, that emphasises really what was going on in the rest mm. of the country as well. This kind of ostracism of mm. the RIC, uh, the Royal Irish Constabulary, um, which were seen as a crown force. So the destruction of their barracks um, in places like Rathvilly mm -hmm. and Fenna and that was giving the message that we don't want uh, the RIC anymore. Mm. Um, and it did cause them to move out of um, their barracks and into bigger spaces, mm. which did actually give impetus to the IRA at the time because it, it was a, a kind of a victory. Um, and of course, once the RIC moved out of their uh, rural uh, barracks, then they were burned down. And that mm. was kind of to make sure they never came back to them again. Yeah. You know? And interestingly, you know, helping in his book on the dead of the, the War of Independence would put Carlo on a percentage basis as having a quite high um, casualty count. Yeah. When you look at it on a, as a portion of the, the population of the county. Yeah, and I mean, there were certainly kind of activities during the War of Independence that did lead to the deaths of people mm -hmm. in Carlo. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of those would have been attacks by the Black and Tans mm -hmm. um, or the auxiliaries mm -hmm. coming into the town. Uh, and a lot of it was in retaliation to other activities. Yeah. Like the burning of Tullow is a very good example of that. Yeah. Um, you know, where they counteracted IRA activities mm -hmm. by setting fire to businesses in, in Tullow. Uh, and of course, that caused, uh, you know, commercial difficulties mm -hmm. uh, for places in Carlow. But they also then would have attacked known IRA suspects mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, that, that would have set out on ambushes in previous times mm -hmm. against the, the Black and Tans and that would have resulted in casualties as well. What makes it a little bit more difficult uh, for, for counties in Ireland, it's not particular to Carlow, is that you know, as some of these wars play out, the War of Independence or the Civil War, uh, you know, the battalions of Carlow amalgamate or draw in people from surrounding counties. And the same for Cumann mm -hmm. Um I mean, if you look at, say, um, you know, Cumann Man organisations that are in the border areas of Carlow, that you'll see people in those from Wicklow um, and Kildare, depending on where they are. So it's hard to delineate everything on a per county mm -hmm. basis because there's other counties come together, you know. Yeah, if you look at the Carlow, it had, it had South Clare and other areas it did, involved yeah. in it, yes. And yeah. I mean, if you go up even into the likes of Collection, which we kind of mm -hmm. take as part of Carlow, even though it's County Leash, you see that, you know, it stretches even beyond that and takes County Leash people into, mm -hmm. into Carlow as well. So, yeah. yeah. I think so. Queen's County, I should say, at the time. I think for the purposes of history, that <laughs> county boundaries are only for football, is, is my opinion. <laughs> um, just, I suppose, speaking about that and the different areas, doing the research, looking at, the, at say, the Bureau of Military History, the, the, the statements in there, I know looking at some of them, for me, would cause my eyebrows to raise a little bit. How do you filter the hyperbole from the actual facts in, in the, in, when you're doing that research, when you're looking at those statements? 
Um, well, first of all, you have to be very careful when you're researching, uh, and the Bureau of Military History witness statements are a fantastic resource. Mm -hmm. But the important thing to remember about that as a resource is that they are from the separatist side. Um, they're only telling one side of the story. And we don't have the equivalent for home rulers or for unionists. Mm -hmm. um, so that's important to remember. And of course, everybody is trying to show themselves to be, you know, very, very active during this revolutionary period. So, um, you know, there, there is exaggerations mm -hmm. of stories. So how do you qualify that? Uh, and how do you find out if something is true or not? Well, you have to read a lot of witness statements uh, to find out that answer. And I mean, you could say the same for the 1641 depositions. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah. once you have that kind of a resource, uh, you, you, you know, if, if you take uh, even the depositions, you, there's 95 of them, um, and they often go on for quite some time mm -hmm. for Carlo. You have to read them all. Mm -hmm. You know, and the same, I would argue, for if you're going to investigate Carlo during the War of Independence from the separatist side, you have to read all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't select uh, just a couple and go with that. Because you, one person will qualify another person's statement. But that's not enough. Uh, you also have to go to the newspapers at the time and see did they report on such and such an event mm -hmm. that happened. So you have to use a number of sources to actually make sure that what happened happened and that the people involved in it were actually involved in it. And of course, they're all trying to get their pensions as well. And the, yeah, later on, then they were trying to get their <laughs> pensions. And then we have to remember as well that these were written in the 1950s under a de Valera government. Mm -hmm. So um, you, you have the problem then of, of any document like that. Uh, you have the problem of recollection. Um, and actually, um, Patrick O'Kane's deposition or witness statement is, is a very, very good example. Uh, because in his opening paragraph, uh, he was from Tinner Island here in Carlow, in his opening paragraph, he refers to the fact that his memory is not that good, mm -hmm. um, but he will do his best kind of thing. Now, his witness statement is actually very, very interesting. And for a man that claims he has no memory, he actually has a very good one. Um, because he, what he writes about it, it is actually true in terms of what happened. But he tells us about a small place like Tinner Island. Um, and he can bring it down to the story of that townland mm -hmm. area and then expand on it to the greater county area as well. So it's invaluable mm -hmm. in terms of, of that regard. And of course, it's very interesting as well for, you know, school children in places like Tinner Island or Hackettstown or wherever it happens to be, that they can actually find witness statements that relate to their own uh, mm -hmm. townlands as well. So that's great for, for history research. And it probably wasn't possible though before, before the 50s really to write them what would it have been? If you think of the folklore collection, there'd be very little reference to the folklore collection from the 30s that, um, to, to events of, the, of, of recent times. Yeah, that, that is true, actually. And then, of course, I mean, if you do think of kind of the hang, hangover from mm -hmm. the Civil War, um, you know, when you do take witness statements like that, you really want to try and get as un, an mm -hmm. unbiased opinion as you possibly can mm -hmm. um, in terms of that. And are there any records that, that you're aware of that we can't access, that, that, you know, either in Ireland or in other countries, that, that may have information that would, 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 would add to the story? I'm not, well, uh, the one that I would love, uh, if, of course, is the 2026 census yeah. um, that we don't have access to at the moment uh, because 100 years mm -hmm. has to pass. Uh, so when that comes out in, I don't know if I said 1926 or 2026, but the 1926 census, when it comes out in 2026, that's going to provide us with huge information. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, 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 I hope I live long enough for that one. <laughs> um, but uh, other than that, no. I think during this time period, we actually have some, some really mm -hmm. good resources uh, in all of the repositories across Ireland, um, in Q archives in the UK, for example, mm -hmm. but in other ones as well. Uh, and the difficulty can be that you have to go through quite a number of repositories, as I did mm -hmm. uh, for, for my research, uh, all over Ireland, right down into county archives if you're looking at counties. Mm -hmm. uh, and I like the local, so therefore that's, uh, you know, I, I want the local story. Uh, so that's time consuming and you mm -hmm. have to dedicate time to that. Good, just to go back to your book, the illustrations in it, I, I, I really like them, and they're very unique, some of them. Mm. Um, here we have, we're very balanced here, we have uh, Union in Strength, and we have Vote for Cosgrave, and they're, 
they're really interesting the way the way that they're um, they're shaped even they're like in the Cosgrove in a, in a little shamrock but then when we go into the book and I'm only going to show some of these um, just a, a chance for South Longford which is a picture and then um, a comparison of records I think it's Sinn Féin is it public two Ireland's non-fiction oh no still three unions council mm. so that's a that's a where did you did you get all these from um, well, you, you travel the length and breadth. Um, I mean, a, a lot of the unionist information you get from the Public Records Office of Northern Ireland or uh, Q Archives in London. And uh, for a lot of the Sinn Féin, you have to go to the likes of UCD archives, uh, where some of the private papers are stored. National Library of Ireland, again, where some of the personal papers of the politicians are stored, uh, like John Redmond, for mm. example, in the, in, in the library. And, um, you know, into Trinity College archives for the likes of John Dillon's papers or Frank Gallagher's papers. So, uh, and then if you want to get local, you have to go to county archives uh, in order to source uh, information. And you, I mean, the other is the provincial newspapers, mm -hmm. which, as I've already mentioned, were wealth uh, of information at, for this particular time. So, uh, but images, uh, propaganda and images and posters were so big uh, during this time, as well as the public speeches that I mentioned that you can't write about elections without sourcing them. And sometimes you actually have to buy them at public auction mm -hmm. um, in order to get them. The one there of uh, William Cosgrave that you showed with the shamrock. Yes. Um, that was actually one of mine. I bought it at a public auction. and uh, But he went on to dominate this constituency mm -hmm. uh, because Carlo becomes Carlo Kilkenny in 1921. And uh, W.T. Cosgrave, aside from 1922, more or less takes the elections mm -hmm. um, in the 1920s here in Carlow. So um, he becomes really important. But that was a pin badge that people wore on their lapel um, to uh, canvas for Cosgrave. And I remember, well, I remember getting copies of some of Lenin's ones as well, which are very interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So most politicians yeah, did have those them, kind yeah. of yeah, pin badge, and you wore them. <laughs> and what's Cos just? I suppose just I don't know the answer to this. Was Cosgrave domiciled in Kilkenny, or was he a, a candidate parachuted in? Uh, well, he was originally from Dublin, um, and worked uh, largely on Dublin Corporation, and then ran for the by-election in Kilkenny City mm -hmm. in 1917, and um, then ran as a can. Well, he, again, he was in a non-contested constituency in 1918 and took that seat there as well. But he, mm -hmm. he stayed in that constituency for a considerable amount mm -hmm. of time. Did, did he ever live there? Do you know, I actually don't know the answer mm -hmm. to that. Yeah. Just interesting, yeah. yeah. Back then you didn't have to live or be from a constituency to run as a candidate in it. I don't think you do nowadays mm -hmm. either, but it's more common to be yeah. from an area now. I suppose to finish off, and I'm going to go back to the counterfactual a little bit, but if there was one event or, or one thing, if you could go back in time, and actually witness or participate in, in that period, what would it be? I'd love to know how I would have voted in 1918. Um, so I'd like to go back just a little bit earlier than that and into the suffrage campaign mm -hmm. in Ireland because I know I would have been very much seeking women's votes uh, at the time. I could see myself in that kind of uh, field. But I could also have seen myself as a home ruler, um, mm -hmm. and uh, but then when you know home rule wasn't for the suffrage campaign, would I have switched over to Sinn Fein? I don't know. Um, is the answer to that one? So I'd like to go back and live through that and see what way would I have turned in 1918. Well, thanks very much, Elaine. This is a really illuminating, interesting conversation. I hope all our, our viewers like it as well. So. Thanks very much, Elaine, again, and I'd like to say, thank um, Carla College St. Patrick's as well for hosting us today and Carla Library and Carla Museum. And my name is John Kelly, and goodbye, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you all for listening, and we invite you to explore more of our podcasts and video series documenting Carlos and Ireland's Decade of Centenians.